What's good, Podcastville? You found the Bystander Podcast. Today, we're welcoming Robert Chelsea. How you doing, Robert? I'm doing good, Bill. Thank you. I really appreciate you coming on and uh, sharing your story because you have an incredible heart, an incredible story, and anything I can do to help destigmatize organ donation and get the word out to be empowered to have empathy for others and, and stand strong and, and give love to all. Um, I think it come, can come through a story like yours. Well, let's, let's share it. And hopefully those that have ears to hear will hear. All right. Well, let's bring people up to speed with your story that have yet, yet to hear it or um, know anything about your, your situation. Okay. I'll I'll let you tell it because uh, I think you speak eloquently about it. And um, I'm going to get out of the way and not ask too many questions until you're done telling the, telling the beginning of the story here. Okay. Well, just, just jump right in wherever you like. Uh, basically, I was a same regular guy until about 10 years ago, an automobile accident, drunk driver. Uh, swerve across the freeway and my car happened to be in the uh, shoulder of the freeway because it had overheated. So, so you went on the left left side of it and oncoming traffic came across? No, I was on the far right. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And and, uh, and uh, so anyway, I, I it was about 10 o'clock at night, and I called a friend of mine to see if he could give me a hand, bring a hose or something, because I figured that's all it was. And while talking with him, I saw the car swerving over. Turned out to be a drunk driver. And he just re- drove right down his shoulder as if he was on, his, on the regular freeway lane, and he ran straight into me. And so and is, it, car, is that from behind or in front? From behind. Okay. My car went up in the air and came down. And then it about probably two or three seconds later, it blew up. So uh, I seemed like I was told to go to my left. And I, 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 I can remember it was audible enough for me to clearly understand that my instructions was to go to my left. And uh, so that's what I did. Seemed like I was going through a long tunnel of fire. Well, of course, it was only a couple of steps away. It just felt like it was much further. So as I was getting out the car, uh, a new friend of mine, uh, better known as a Samaritan, his name is Richard Robles. He was right there. He saw everything, and he assisted me getting out the car. And we went and checked to see if the guy was okay. And uh, then he helped me uh, to go to a safe area. And in his attempt to assist me, to find a, a, a safe area, he said he tried to take my arms because my arms were melting. So he had to take a belt buckle and put it around my waist and slowly uh, escort me to an area. I was still unconscious all that time. And when the first responders came, I told them who I was and who to call. I just figured that somebody would come and pick me up from the, from the hospital after being checked out. I didn't realize that I was so severely burned. Um, anyway, when I was escorted to the gurney, uh, the ambulance, I, I remember sitting down and laying back, figuring somebody would meet me at the, air, at the, at the hotel, I mean, uh, the hospital, yeah. yeah. And uh, anyway, when I woke up, it was six months later. 
So you were in a coma that wasn't induced. It it happened from the accident. Yes, that's correct. Wow. And how 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 burned were you from this accident? Well, it just depends on who you talk to. Some say 35, 45, 60, 65, 70. I, you know, it, the, uh, the range pretty much covered my whole face, head, feet, you know, but naturally all of it wasn't completely burned. Some of it, when you see me, you'll see grass in certain spots. So I don't know, but a great deal was covered uh, in the fire. So when you woke up, what did you find out about the six-month coma? What was going on with you? I I didn't realize I had been in a coma. So many people uh, insisted that I was in a coma, that I'm a miracle man, and you know God just saw fit to to bring me alive after all that time. And I, uh, it took about a week or two before I realized that this, I was actually in a coma. All during that time, I, I, I could tell you a little bit about my coma experience. I, I'm not sure how much time we have. We got all day for you, Robert. Yeah, well, um, during the time that, now that I know it was a coma, I had a friend. He was so reliable, so easy to talk with. He was my confidant. And I'd ask him, you know, about my daughter, how she's doing, how, and he was able to answer all of my inquiries in a way that he assured me that he knew who I was talking about. And it just seemed like we were just best buddies through all of this. So I had no clue that there was days and nights passing. I just knew that, you know, I had a real good friend and we always had a real good, pleasant time together. And and, and when the nurses and doctors and, and, and friends started telling me I was in a coma, I, in my mind, I was thinking, they were just adding to my day. You know how you have a nice day and then all of a sudden you, some new friends come around and your family come around and and so they're just, you, you know, you've already, you, you're in a good company and then someone else drops out, drop, drop, and drops over. And then someone else drops over. And someone else, so that's kind of how I felt, but they all told me, oh, you're in a coma all this time. You, you know, I don't think it was when you guys just started coming over. I, I couldn't, couldn't imagine that. that, that couldn't quite comprehend that that had happened. Yeah. Uh huh. And now, during that time, my my lips had been burned off, and part of my tongue and and other parts of my my body, and uh, uh, you know, it, it was severe, but I, by God's grace, I did not realize it because when I woke up, I had no pain whatsoever. I could see because I was still in the bed, uh, the, the sheets are over you, you know, blankets and so on, and I could see my arms and my legs that they were all grafted up. Why do you think there was, you felt no pain? <sighs> Don't know. Well, who else or what else could I attribute that to? Your faith. It, it certainly couldn't be because, oh, I just can handle a lot of pain. No. I mean, how far does tolerance go? Right. But fortunately, uh, I was just simply covered. And as a result of that, I hesitate sometimes to, to share that because. You know, it's man will rationalize anything, especially something not just incomprehensible, but something that he refuses 
to uh, accept, because you can't intellectually uh, figure that out. You can't use a slide rule uh, on this. Uh, it's not scientific in, in man's mind. But what do you know about science? I mean, all those planets weren't created by science, nor was the sun or the moon that we're uh, closest to. So, uh, but he uses, he goes right back to science and, oh, yeah, you got to have proof. Well, have as much proof as you want. But I know I'm so grateful that I did not have an opinion. And hopefully, uh, I don't think Daniel was throwing in the lines then. He never got good. Mm. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown in a fiery furnace and they never got singed. We know that Moses was in the wilderness for 40 years and they had the same uh, uh, suits of, of clothing and shoes for all those years. So, uh, yes, some things are far beyond our comprehension. Yeah. Um, did you have anything amputated or, or lost in the in this? What happened there? Yes, I well during the the uh, coma, uh, they had to take a lot of stuff and move things around. You know, uh, they had to take out two thirds of my intestines, things like that, and. After I woke up, then we realized a lot of things. My, I, I had to have a couple of amputations on my feet because they had turned gang green. And the same with my fingers, uh, a couple of these fingers. They had, you know, the different things happened as a result of the other accident and the burns. Obviously, the accident caused a lot of jarring. I don't know how much or how severe that was because I guess I was healed uh, during that time. I can see remnants of what, like my thumb, uh, th th this thumb goes all a weird angle. Mm -hmm. My hands are cadaver skin. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So they had to put this on just because there's so much fluid that comes out when you're uh, burned. They have to cover yeah. it up some kind of way. And in this case, they used uh, cadaver skin. So that's one of the reasons why I'm here today talking with you. There's uh, the major benefits uh, that has happened for me as a result of receiving a transplant. And others have donated uh, their loved one's body or the individual has donated their body to allow a person like myself in a time of great need to be able to cover my hands up. And you, uh, if you ever notice my hands, fingers, they're growing like another person. So these, my, my nails never grew like this. And they grow much, much faster. And they grow a lot different. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, when you had your intestine removed, how does that change your diet and how you eat? It changes in all kinds of different ways. Yeah. Uh, my portions are less. And there's a lot that would irritate me, like uh, um, tomato products. Uh, onions and lemon. How you do with mushrooms? Is mushrooms, uh, avocado, things like that. Uh, I have to avoid. I mean, I, I I eat a little bit, kind of a little bit once in a while, but it's not recommended. For that matter, red meat is not recommended either. But I was mainly a fish and chicken person anyway. Mm -hmm. But if you got a barbecue, barbecue coming up, don't forget to invite <laughs> I love it. I won't. Uh, we need to get you out here, period. 
Oh yeah, I'd love to come. Yeah, Seattle, Seattle, Seattle needs a voice like yours. I uh, used to go uh, in and out of Seattle. I had the Western States for several years in the eighties, nineties, and uh, uh, Seattle. I'd fly into SeaTac and make my way between uh, the Seattle area. Let's see, there was another. Uh, the headquarters for Intermac. That's uh. Not familiar with that business? Intermac. They're the barcode company. They're the ones that oh. that, that uh, created barcodes. I used to work with them for a while. Uh, anyway, so yes, I'm very familiar with the area years back, but I've always longed to have a reason to go back. Uh, I'll tell you a little secret. I don't know what your audience would think of this, but I was married and I, uh, to protect myself from uh, this old knucklehead thinking the wrong kind of thoughts, I'd always set my, wherever I went for that matter, I tried to set my appointments up in that city along with a basketball game or a football game, <laughs> uh, usually basketball games, uh, track meets, things like that. And so that way, uh, during my my time uh, that, that I had to spend uh, waiting for a customer or uh, to, rather than eating dinner by myself in a hotel, mm-hmm. a game. So that was a way of occupying my time in, in innocence without looking for trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Are you married now, currently? No, I'm officially divorced. Uh, but I fortunately... Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it, it was for the right reasons. My my wife had has has a condition, and as a result of this particular condition, it, it's so rare that it, it it's uh, it's very difficult for her to have anyone around her. She need, really needs this. I don't know if you ever heard of OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, and anyway, it's a condition where, you know, you are uh, paranoid, uh, just, just various things that, that you know. Yeah, you, I understand. Yeah. So as a result of that, my daughter and I, uh, we would go and visit her mother. Mm-hmm. Just the opposite, you know, the, the father usually comes and picks the child up for uh every other week or so. But for me, I was fortunate. My daughter lived with me from junior high school on. And of course, we made sure. You guys must be very close. Yeah, yeah. So uh, all those years, even though we were married, uh, we weren't together. During my accident, my wife was so kind in spite of her own physical and mental uh, condition, she signed off on every single surgery. And it was it exceeded 30 to 40 surgeries while I was in a coma. She, she signed off to keep me alive because I was coded three or four times. Uh, so, oh, oh. so our relationship has always been good. But uh, about five years ago, and we're talking like, uh, we got married in 1980. So in 19, in 2016 or 17, I asked her, since I knew I was going to have the face transplant, I we agreed to just let, let's make this official. So she wouldn't have to go through the pressure of signing and releasing all of, that she did uh, valiantly, but it wouldn't be fair if something like that occurred uh, during my transplant. So that's why we officially uh, divorced to take away her obligations. 30 or 40 surgeries, and then you had 
you're the first African American to have a face transplant. How many hours and how many surgeries was a face transplant? I don't even understand how that's possible. I mean, it's an incredible thing of of science and medicine and your stick to and ability to believe in yourself. I, I don't believe in myself. What do I have to offer? But strength. I trust God. I mean, how, how far can even my strength go? Really? I mean, I'm not Superman. Uh, mm. But the comfort that I have been provided far exceeds any of my capacity or strength or belief or trust uh, or faith. I, I was privileged to have this experience and have an overseer that would care so much to uh, allow me to be painless, to, to provide uh, the very best of care in terms of uh, the person that did my face transplant, he was the world-renowned transplant surgeon in the whole world. Uh, at, at the most notable medical center in the world, Harvard University. So, I mean, and for a black man to uh, be escorted into uh, a circumstance like this, and others sign off, my insurance, uh, I have Kaiser insurance, you know, how many people would you imagine would allow, you know you're going to lose money with a, a, a person that has a face tan, nobody else, they can't, they can't make that money back on medicine because uh, there's nobody else that, 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 that would require that kind of medication. Are you on some type of lifetime medication now? Yes, I am. I, I take the same medication that the majority of transplant recipients take, liver, lung, kidney, heart. Uh, we all take similar medication. Now, the amount and so on may, may vary, but we all take, and it's like very, very expensive. But uh, it just seemed like God arranged where not only did Medicare take care of X amount, but Kaiser agreed, this is after going through about a year and a half of ups and downs and red tape, and <laughs> But they agreed to eat the rest of the cost that Medicare would not pay. That's awesome. Yeah. Now, who could have designed that? I certainly, I wouldn't dare even request such a privilege. But I mean, that provided for me. It's still very rare and young. I think face transplants are 20 years young. Basically, 2005 was the first, and there's less than 50 in the whole world done. That's correct. And correct. you're the only black man that has it done, correct? Now, is there different genetics and, and such that you have to take into consideration that it makes it more difficult, or is it a uh, certain stigmatization against or organ donorship? Well, there's all of the above. And these questions are very good questions. Thank uh, you. The my ethnicity has a great deal to do with uh, how they make adjustments. Now, remember, we're not talking about black surgeons that would have a, at least some idea of how my body operates. I'll give you an example in. The journals, medical journals, for uh, for face transplants and things like that, they have they have written that there are certain signs you can look for for potential rejection, transplant rejection. One of the signs is blue lips. Well, that doesn't apply to me. Uh -huh. Another sign is white knuckles. That doesn't apply. Pale face, redness of face, 
pink face. So uh, for me, unless unless it's someone of my own uh, culture and, and color, they are not used to surgeons. They're not used to looking for signs of rejection from me because they, they're not familiar with it. So what are the new signs that they've discovered regarding eject, uh, rejection and and you being a person of color? Well, they are, I'm sure they're learning a little here and there, but remember, I'm the only one. So it, it's not like they have a lot to judge from. Compare it to, yeah. yeah. And uh, the others, uh, it's so much easier, and it's still not easier because it's only 47 of us uh, in the world. So it's still easier, though, for them to physically look and see certain things, whereas for me, uh, it, it almost has to get to a critical level where they can say, oh, well, wait, this, let's check this. I, you know, we, we didn't see this. And so, uh, fortunately, it hasn't been so serious that, and I, and I live across the country, you know, I live in the Los Angeles area, and all, all of the face transplants that were done were in the New England or, or uh, Northern area. So, the communication, the clinic visits, things like that, uh, you know, I'm one of the rare people that live all the way across uh, the mm-hmm. country. And Do you have to go go in often for testing and evaluation and such? Well, as it turns out, my uh, the, the the standard evaluation process that was you know established before uh, before my transplant was uh, it would be every three months and then every six months and then every year. But I got my transplant in July, the summer of 2019. Well, uh, 90 days later was COVID. I'm on the West Coast, so I can't fly back and forth to be checked. And the hospital, you know, the restrictions that was. So that threw off the schedule that they normally had for face transplant uh, patients. And, and we have yet to get it on any regular. Fortunately, the doctors, nurses, the uh, all the specialty disciplines, including the, uh, the, the pharmacists, they're all from Kaiser, have been not only cooperative, but have exceeded any expectation that Boston would have expected. Mm. And as a result of that, it hasn't been the, the need for me to have to go as often as I should under normal proto- protocol. Uh, and does insurance take care of your um, travel? No, no one not noticed. No, the expenses are still extremely uh, high. <laughs> yeah, and of course, you know, you're looking at paying uh, a rent at your own place and. Uh, Place that you're visiting. The the my look seven thousand dollars a month uh, for ninety days at in, in uh, Boston. But bearing in mind, uh, well, I, I was going to tell you two things. Shoot. In terms of finance, I'll go back, come back to that in a minute. Uh, the other forty six patients that received a face transplant. Some of them were full face transplant, some of them were partial. They, the cutoff for evaluating whether they could be a, a viable candidate to receive a face transplant was age 50. I was already about 62 or three when, they, when we started talking about face transplants. So that's what, why I'm I'm at least 10 years older than anyone else that ever had a face test. So let's bring people up to speed here. You were kind of out of the hospital after three years, 
And then they came to you that they had found a donor or were they talking about facial reconstruction and a transplant prior to that? Um, was there a lot of hesitation on your behalf? Well, what happened, I was actually in the hospital a year and a half. The first six months was, you know, in a coma. coma. But I still had to say, because my vital signs, a heart, lung, liver, and so on, they still had not shown any improvement. Um, so I was actually in about six different locations, not different, four different locations, two locations twice. Um, from August 2013 to December, I was at uh, UCI, University of California, Irvine, Burn Center. They're the ones that did a great job with, with uh, saving my life. But after they did as much as they could do, they sent me to a long-term facility called Kindred in December 2013. I woke up two months later in February 2014. And uh, that's when we discovered there was all kinds of other things that needed to be done, uh, including rehabilitation. So they sent me to another special place called Rancho Las Amigas. I was there for three weeks, but I wasn't strong enough to recover or start the recovery process as we had hoped. So they sent me back to UCI, uh, University of uh, Irvine, because my head had yet to be fully grafted it had all kind of stuff all over. And uh, my amputations had to take place. So after I went there, of course, they attempted to rehabilitate me a little bit. Then they sent me to the long-term facility again, where I had a little bit more uh, therapy and so on. And that's when... Uh, that overall took about a year and a half. So once I got out at the end of 2014, I had to find insurance because who's going to cover you? You know, uh, you all burned up. And Kaiser, about five or six months later, I, I had to pay. I was self-employed, and I, I did have some. Uh, residual income commissions that the factory could. I got all this time that I was in the accident, burned and all that. The factory continued to handle all my orders, all the customers, shipping, receiving, billing. And all the commissions were sent to my daughter. For that matter, even to this very day. It's incredible. Yeah. Uh, that's J.P. Cook is, is my company. And that, uh, who, who else could ask for that? Now, during that time, whenever uh, other people, this is not first just for me, but I'm sure others that have been in uh, challenging uh, circumstances, you lose everything. What do you mean by everything? Your bank account, they don't know where you are. The IRS don't know where you are. The state friend, they don't know where you are. Your bill collectors, they have no clue where you are. So they shut you down, they put liens on you, they put levies to collect their money. So it is uh, it's quite a, so you lose your, if you have a mortgage, that's gone. After, after a year and a half, year and a half, you, can, you have no way of committing, oh, my cell phone and personal computer, all that was all burned up in the fire. So, uh, any customer names and numbers and all of that, that's gone. So, there was a great deal that just is completely wiped away. And, uh, as a result of that, uh, you have to still 
find a way, fortunately, Obamacare kicked in and took care of everything that we could. You're lucky in more ways than one. Do you really think that was luck? Now, it's okay, you know. But yeah, I'd... I think, you know, these these things, these dominoes that keep falling in your favor, uh, it's fortunate for sure. Uh, maybe luck's not the best way to describe it, but it's... It's okay. It's That's good. Right. So uh, I, I'm just highlighting. This means it just highlights. Mm-hmm. And so as a result of that, uh, uh, the emphasis on, on expenses that the expenses just didn't go, start from the transplant. That in itself becomes uh, a nightmare because there are medical expenses that are out, out, outrageous. One, one particular medication in 2016, we had to test it to make sure my body could handle it. It cost $11,300 for a 60 day supply. That's outrageous. That was in 2016. Yeah. And do you still take it now? Oh, yeah. That's what well, that was a, a mandatory for the rest of my life. But uh, they gave that to me, the, 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 the manufacturer, but they give you a waiver and say, we will let you have this for a year at no charge. But after that, you have to pay for it. So in order for me to get tested, I had to sign a waiver for that first year. I got the, the test, you know, the, the test, and it came out okay. But now after that, I have to pay for it. Well, when I say all, of course, my uh, since I was able to, to acquire self-employment insurance, I had to pay for that. And then eventually, Kaiser took me on. Of course, I paid for, paid for that too, but it wasn't as much uh, than if you're paying for it uh, uh, completely out of your pocket. I, I just have a very high copay. It, it ex- always exceeds anywhere between five to five hundred and fifty a month. Wow, that's just the copay. And you, you look anyway. So yeah. That is uh, one of the one of the challenges. Uh, but you know, I was halfway broke before the accident. You know, you can be broken a lot of ways financially. Uh, but this is another way that, that that is a financial challenge. Now, getting graphs like you have done, there's always a fear of rejection, and you're in a situation where you've taken somebody else's face on that it's not quite the same. uh, What's a good word for it? Pigmentation that you had prior to that. That's correct. How apprehensive were you in even proceeding in this process? Well, fortunately, again, uh, what you want to believe, not you personally, but whoever, when I saw the car coming, going back to the accident, when I saw that car coming, and it, you know, he, the guy wasn't slowing down, I thought to myself, well, this looks like, you know, and as I was, these are in nanoseconds, of course, mm-hmm. uh, this voice said, you're not going to die. And when the accident, the impact came, I went up in the air, the car, you know, the whole car went up in the air and came down. So, and I'm still alive. And then about two or three seconds later, boom, car blows up. So I I spoke to this boy saying, I thought you said I wasn't going to (laughs) die. You know, because um, here's another, you know, surprise. This big old 
fire. And this, that's when I told you the voice said, go to the left. And I went to the left in a tunnel of fire, but I got out. Samaritan was right there to help me and escort me out. So if you didn't have faith, I'll say in that voice, well, I guarantee you, if you personally is going then you would. That doesn't mean you can convince somebody else, you know. But so through that process, up until this point, uh, I have had, if you will, a green light to go through the face transplant. We we talked to many uh, plastic surgeons and uh, all of them said that there's not a lot they could do except because my lips were burned off. They, they could put a flap to cover and protect my gums and teeth, but it wouldn't have any control so that I could move my lips around. You know? So uh, the last plastic surgeon who happens to be at Kaiser, and he's a friend of mine now, Walter Chang, Dr. Walter Chang. He had a friend who had studied under my surgeon. Uh, my surgeon's name is uh, Bolden Pomahawk. They talked among themselves, contacted Pomahawk. Pomahawk called me and felt that I might be a good candidate. So they invited me to come to Boston for a three-day evaluation. I met with all, you know, all the directors of each discipline. Uh, and we had a good, you know, I was still weak. I could still couldn't walk, by the way. 2015, I still couldn't walk. And um, anyway, so I eventually had a five-day evaluation, uh, you know, months later. So it all seemed to have fallen in line in spite of me being over 10 years older than anyone that they had ever done. So uh, the domino effect <laughs> was still quite alive. And so I didn't have the apprehension uh, that, you know, maybe someone else might have. I didn't have to be talked into it uh, or convinced or, you know, but it seemed like uh, I had been led this way. Uh, and, and I assure you, it's not like I'm looking for another surgery or another inconvenience. No, I bet. But I've been comforted in such a way that it doesn't matter what kind of challenge that might be before me, especially a physical challenge, because though I walk through valleys of sounds of death, I haven't had to fear evil. Very well said. So how are you spending your days nowadays? Uh, well, I, I'm still recovering. I do, of course, I uh, talk with different uh, companies. I school, not, not as many companies as I do hospital students and other high school, middle school kids. I talk to other organizations that, you know, that... Uh, health organizations about the possibilities of the great technology that's available. You know, one eye can save eight eyes. How, how does that work? Uh, there's so many, many different parts of our eye that can be applied to someone else. What One body itself it, it can far exceed uh, helping 50 different other people. Different cadavers, skin grafts, bone. That's right. You know, I had a tooth pulled uh, last week, and they had 
uh, donor bone that it was ground up and sterilized and that they could pack into the bridge of my jaw if if I wanted to have that done. You know, it's, no, I know tell, me, tell me some of the stigmas that you find or have learned about through this process about organ donation. Well, man comes up with all kinds, you know. That's just where we are. Uh, we can claim that there's a religious concern. But th- that, that doesn't mean that those people are just so religious. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, you're still sitting at the bar on Saturday night, uh, in spite of how they <laughs> might be in the choir on Sunday morning. Yeah, very well said. Yeah, so, you know, that, uh, and of course, there are many legitimate concerns because of uh, background experiences, the way others have been treated, especially uh, certain ones have been more prioritized than others. I mean, would you rather have a pretty face or not so pretty? I mean, that's just natural. Mm -hmm. Other things that are natural, we'd rather have our own than someone else's, and so on. So these preferential treatment uh, can get way out of hand. Uh, 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 common sense doesn't actually apply. No, no more than when people say, "Well, you know, I try to love the other guy." That's a lie. I mean, I I believe they try, but what method are they using? Are they really focusing, concentrating? Are they giving their all to it, or is it just a Oh, you know, it's like saying I I, I try to be a good uh, 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 ball player, but you never practice. You you know, you just you know, there's no you know. So people have their own ideas of what should be. Uh, should they do a female instead of a male? And or if one cries louder, do they get better attention? Or the position that they may hold. Uh, so these things are almost irreversible unless we deal with our own personal uh, conviction of God treating each other as best we can according to those circumstances. Con- have you found some, some who you thought may have been a friend in the past when you ha- went through this that were Kind of the, that that fake person when it came down to it? Uh, probably, but... Your friends stuck with you, most of them? Yes. And, and I, I think, uh, well, I was a, I'm convinced that kindness pays dividends that no man could measure. And uh, there's a, a place for every, uh, uh, I'll give you this. Friends have said to me that they, some, some of them have been mad with me or mad with the drunk driver and they get mad with me because I don't have any reason to, to hold it against them. And they think I should. You've forgiven the man who had three DUIs that put you in this current situation, correct? I didn't forgive him because I don't, I didn't charge him with anything. Why would I? Uh, it, it was an accident. Yeah, I mean, one of the first things you did was worry about the person that hit you. Well, I mean, but if a person is hurt, you know, it should be instinct to yep. to see how that person's doing. There's no, uh, you, you know, how many times have either one of us lied intentionally, mm-hmm. deceived, uh, manipulate, uh, manipulated, said we're going to pay a bill and didn't pay it. No, we weren't going to pay it. Couldn't have the money to pay it. Hey. We have caused others to stumble throughout our life and still do. 
And yet, because I get twisted a little more than you got twisted, oh, he's got, oh, something's got to be done to him right now because he did this to me. And I, we didn't do, God could have let that car swerve around me. Yeah, there's no. He didn't let me, he didn't, it wasn't the, the guy, he, he was the vessel that that car got hit and all that, but God let this happen. And I'm so glad he did. What Look, do you say to people that say if there was a God, he would never do this to a person like you? Well, obviously they're ignorant. They, what does ignorant mean? Slow to learn. Haven't quite comprehended yet. <laughs> See? Because uh, now maybe their God, whatever in their head is, is a God. Maybe that God, I mean, you can dream up a lot of things. People paint pictures. Look at the pictures of, uh, uh, of what they call Jesus as a, a Michelangelo interpretation. Well, he's got all kind of beautiful. I don't think any of those apostles looked anything like handsome men because they were beat up all the time. No, that's a good point. They probably had all kinds of twisted arms and legs if they had any at all. Yeah. Jesus so, looked like he had a hairdresser. Uh, yeah. So the imagination that man comes up with, oh, why would a God let you? Well, you better, maybe you ought to switch your gods because uh, I did go through this. And not only did I, but he provided this thread, if you will, of comfort in such a way that I had no complaints. You know, you've heard of terms like being on a mountaintop experience, and some people have been in a valley experience. Well, I discovered that there's lilies in the valley. Now, why would I want to leave that? Yeah, it's perspective. We're praying for you to uh, completely return to normal, uh, a total recovery. Well, you're praying for the wrong thing because well, I, if you're going to pray, pray that I enjoy the ride, that I see every corner of what God has provided for me in this valley experience. Thus far, it's been wonderful. Robert, you're a strong man, for sure. Um, I look up to you. Let me ask you a semi-tough question, but I don't think there's any tough questions for you to answer right now because I think you got a good grip on life and uh, a great outlook. Do you feel anything spiritually about your cadavers? You know, the person that your your face came from was a person that was troubled and tried to commit suicide and became brain dead. And then you've gleaned this person's face. Is there any part of you that has absorbed their spirit? Well, I'm not sure where you got your data from. Was um, that incorrect? Well, I can't say whether it's correct or not because I don't have that kind of data to uh, to uh, uh, consider. And HIPAA laws don't allow me to have it unless I talk with them direct. Uh, I had heard of heard that through uh, researching prior to talking to you. So yeah. uh, sorry if I stepped out of bounds there. Not not at all. It, it, the, what you are sharing could be uh, correct. I who, who you know who knows? Yeah, yeah. But but do you feel any anything spiritually like that? Like some part of them is with you? No, don't feel that. My, uh, I see every day, I see this person that mm -hmm. doesn't look like the person I used to be. But, and so I'm still getting, my daughter still gets used to, you know, you can hear my voice, the tone, and so on, and detect, oh, this is, you know. But other than that, uh, I don't think I've taken on, other than, I, I have to, like this hair, I didn't have any hair. I didn't. Have, I didn't have a, a beard. But this is his. You know, it's different. Yeah, I think I should share with you something that would be um, helpful to you and your audience too. Please uh, do. 
the face transplant is so different than a long liver, kidney, and so on. Because one would have oh. to take one in and put one out. And also, it's internal. Nobody knows who has another liver, lung, heart. Um, for me, this hair, I don't know if you can see, but this, oh, yeah. this is where all that started. So I would rather conquer my hair, side, forehead. This wasn't my nose. I have another nose, cheeks, another chin, lips. All of that is foreign to me. And it's not even lined up quite, you know, to, to the naked eye, it looks like it's not. But I'm used to, say, uh, taking a spoon and going here. Well, but my lips are over here. <laughs> and it's, uh, so these little dynamics that are idiosyncrasies uh, are visible to me, maybe not to someone else. But w when they take a face, a donor's face, they prepare that donor's face by stripping it down. They prepare my face by stripping it down. And they have to sew every nerve and blood vessel muscle, tendon, tissue, they have to put this all together from top to bottom. Open. That's incredible. You start yeah. considering how um, deep it goes, you know, there's so much levels, it's just not slapping some skin on your head. Right. So the medication has to vary depending on what's needed for this may not be needed for that. And this, so, you know, like my lips, uh, you see this lip, the bottom lip, uh, I have to do this to keep the bottom lip tight. Because the nerve endings and the blood vessels, you know, they have yet to, if at all, they have yet to uh, control or or start controlling the way yours might. And so, in the meantime, I I make special, but I can smile, this is my smile. Uh, this is my uh, poker. Mm -hmm. My heart looks the same. So, it's just, uh, a lot of the nerve endings and all these different, uh, they, they, some of them have started working properly, some of them partially work, and some of them may not ever. And what about your taste buds? You taste, taste food? Taste buds, taste buds are, are, are a lot different. Everything still tastes good to you? Uh, no. No. no, no, and because my my part of my tongue was wearing down, the tip of my I, well, majority of those taste buds are. Yeah, gotcha. Even for hot and cold too. Ah, yeah. fascinating. Well, Robert Chelsea, I really appreciate talking to you, and I hope we can do it again. Um, you are such a great dude. Um, can you tell the people where they can um, get a little bit more information about you? I know there's robertchelsea.org is your website. Um, you uh, had a busy 2022 speaking with a lot of different organizations. Uh, can you shout out a few of those that um, that you're working with and uh, care about deeply? Well, I... I care about them all. It's not the organization so much as if we can just inform individual souls that they 
are able to help so many just the willingness of donating their body uh, upon their death. Uh, that's if they if they can do that, they don't have to ask for too much more. And uh, so the organizations, most of them are for that purpose, whether they're large organizations or small, and most of them have been started uh, by individuals like myself that have gone through certain challenges that have caused them to not only be appreciative of having a new life, and most a lot of them are able to go right back to work, especially, you know, you get another heart, now you're ready to go again, or kidney, lung, and liver. So that's a little different, and and uh, because they appreciate it so much, they organize, or they establish a foundation, hoping that somebody will will respond and become a, a, a donor uh, to help somebody else out. And because ethnic groups are so important, if, if another ethnic person didn't allow their family to to donate their, their, their loved one's face, I wouldn't have one. So, uh, and st certain stem cells can eliminate sickle cell. Mm -hmm. It's important that we all, every ethnic group, uh, donate or increase the donation uh, um, for each and every group because everybody, humanity, has a diaspora that is disabled. I'll call them disabled diaspora. And that one eye can make them live again. You know what that means? There's a degree of self-confidence, self-esteem. They can look at their fellow neighbor uh, eye to eye, or they can embrace one another, go out together and not be different than the next person. And so why, why wouldn't we want something like that for uh, our, our fellow man? You can go right back to the workforce. And some of them have been in conditions like that where they've never been in the workforce. So, yeah, we want to make sure that we increase, encourage others to, to do that. The places that I've been last year were, I tried to go someplace once a month. Uh, I was at a roundtable discussion with Gail, and I was at, in Florida, uh, Florida State University, with medical students there. Um, I was at, of course, Brigham Women's Hospital, that's Harvard Hospital. Um, and I tried to go to, I was at several high schools uh, and, and K through eight uh, middle schools. I've been at special ed schools. As a matter of fact, those special ed kids, they wrote notes and drew pictures and so on and mailed them to me while I was in Boston. And uh, the teacher, you know, that was so excited that contacted me and said, well, I'm not just saying hi to them. Well, I, I tricked them. I said, well, wh why would I just want to get on the phone and say hi? I drove to their school one day and uh, I, I, I let the teacher know and the teacher let the principal know and, you know, and all that, but the kids didn't know. And Very so, cool. Oh, That's so cool. Yeah. So, because remember, uh, kids go through a lot of stuff. You know that. Bullies can bother you because you don't walk the same way, talk, look. Uh, you're not as athletic or, you know, take on the same interest. Yep. But they don't know that inside of this these clothes that they're covered with, they could have been burned, a house fire, uh, a, 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 a ironing board fire, a stove fire, barbecue, electrocutions. Uh, so much could have happened to them that would cause them not to be able to walk like the regular kids or talk like the regular kids and so on. 
this auto accident that I was in, you hear my voice now, my mouth opens about this wide. Now the average person opens about that wide and, and, and they, they can shoot like this. Well, mine opens this wide and all I can do is this. Mm -hmm. That's how I eat. And I, I use a syringe to drink from. I, I'm, I'm beginning to learn how to use a straw, but I still can't use a bottle, drink out of a bottle or a glass or cup. Can't do that. So you never know, and uh, did I cause that? No, but you never know what a youngster is going through. And I, that's one of the things I try to inform the kids uh, uh, to, to be considerate of others. Excuse mm me. -hmm. All right, so I'm going to let you go. I've taken a lot of your time. Um, this has been great. Thank you. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yeah. And you they, think want to me, they can also, they can Google me. As you, oh, they can Google my name even. And, and that's a route to get to us as well. Okay. Well, you've been listening to Bystander with Robert Chelsea and Timothy Self. Be kind. <laughs>